Yep. I guess I only have one option. This is all gotta come out again. Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the shop. It's time to take everything back out in order to start at the bottom. That's right, the subfloor was put in, but now it's time to put in the actual floor so we can build everything up from there. The installation of the floor has been the source of a big dilemma for me. There's two different ways that I see of doing this. One is putting in all the furniture and then putting the floor in around it, thus allowing me to attach the furniture directly to the subfloor. The other way is installing the floor on the whole area and then installing all the furniture over top of it. Obviously there's very different reasons for doing it each way. If I install all the furniture and then the flooring, it makes it much easier to change out the flooring should the need arise down the road. However, if I install the flooring first and the furniture after, it gives me a smooth consistent floor in all the areas where I'm going to have things like drawers. This will allow me to have one surface that's flat through the entire area. But if I ever have to change the flooring out, it means all that needs to come out in order to make the change. So after weighing out all the options over and over and over again, and not really being able to say one way is better than the other, I've decided to do it the easier way for me, and that is to cover the entire floor in one layer and then build up above that. Now normally underneath this type of flooring, you would have a thin layer of foam to allow things to shift around. Because the size of this floor is so small, I'm gonna skip that, and that means when I do secure the furniture, I'll be going through the upper flooring into the subfloor, and nothing will have a chance to move anyway. So this is not as much of a floating floor as it would normally be. Hopefully, that doesn't cause any issues down the road. And obviously, in order to be able to coat the entire floor, everything has to come out except for the kitchen sink. Luckily, we don't have a kitchen sink, so it'll just be the kitchen. There's no way I'm moving that in and out, so what I'm going to do is shift it over, floor that side, and then we'll put it back. As much as Krista really would have liked to have acacia flooring, we just could not justify spending $600 on a floor in a space this small. So we've gone to the next best thing we could find, which is about half the price and about twice what I was expecting to spend. The laminate flooring it's not something new for us inside trucks. Our last truck, the white Fuso, actually had laminate flooring in it as well. And we took it one step beyond that. We even had it on the walls. So although it may not be the first choice for everyone's build, I think it'll do the trick for us. As for durability, I think we'll be all right. The company does claim to have a 35 year warranty, though I'm sure there's some sort of clause voiding the warranty for using it in a vehicle or outside a home. It is pretty thick. It's a half inch or 12 millimeters thick. So there is a decent amount of it. And as with that, there's a bit of weight. Each box weighs about 27 pounds and we're using six boxes. So we're gonna be adding a little over 160 pounds of weight to the Habitat box. Each of these boards is just shy of 54 and a half inches long. And that's gonna work out pretty well for where the kitchen is placed. This is gonna end up with a seam under the kitchen. The next board will also be a seam under the kitchen, which does give us the slimmer possibility that if we do have a water leak underneath the kitchen, which is one of the more likely places to have one, we could remove just the kitchen and replace just the boards underneath the kitchen. It's not gonna be easy to do that, and I really hope we don't have to do that, but I am, for the first three or four boards, going to keep these seams fairly close together. Normally, you want a decent amount of stagger between them, gives it a bit more strength, 
This is underneath the kitchen. I'm not as concerned about strength. I won't have them side by side, but I do really want to keep them in this area here to give us the possibility of doing a repair underneath there if we need to. Well, the first two boards are always the easy ones, right? You don't have to do any cutting. The trick that I've found in the past is if you actually angle them up a little bit when you're trying to slide this seam together, they just form themselves as one. So, two boards down. That was pretty easy. If you've never done laminate flooring before, I've got a couple little tricks that might help you. These I'm sure are not the only tricks, but these are ones that I have found in the past have made things go more easily for me. When you lay your first course down, I've got a gap down at the far end. I also have a gap at this end. I've placed the last board in here backwards, as in my lip is on this side of this board, it's on the other side of that board. And what this does is it allows me to put the mating end up against the wall with a gap. And then the end that I'm going to cut just lines up exactly with where the end of the last board is. Let's see if we can get you in there upside down. Okay, so it's just overlapping the previous board. And this means I don't have to measure anything. I'm just going to put a piece of tape where I need to cut and go out there and cut it. Remember, I'm cutting the opposite end. You're facing the other way, so it's the opposite end. I'm cutting the end that's going over here, but because this board is in backwards, that end is currently over here. So here I can see the underlying board. This is the length that my board needs to be. I'm gonna put a piece of tape that lines up with the mating edge. So that's this edge, not, not the edge that is the end of the board, but the edge of the upper part. This lines up, and I'm also just going to put a mark on here that I want to cut that side of the tape, because if you cut this side of the tape, it's not going to fit. So now that I've cut this at the green line, I can take the tape off, flip the board around, pop this joint together, and I end up with the right amount of gap at the wall. No measuring tape involved. And normally my next move would be to take the off cut from that end and start the next row with it. But because I'm trying to keep this first seam in the right place, I'm gonna start again with a fresh board and just cut two inches off. I'll save this piece for when I get farther along and the row after the one I'm doing now, I'll just start with a full board like I did the first row. For the next row, you can see I've cut just enough off to shift this seam back. That'll let my next board come back and keep everything under the kitchen, and then I'll trim the last board once again. But I've been thinking that I'm probably approaching us from the wrong end, because that wall is very straight and supported, whereas this wall is an angle and jumps out around the spare tire well. So I think after this row, I'm going to start doing it from that end and running this way. This flooring appears to go together a little bit different from what I've been used to. The ones that I've used before, I've had to put a block on the end, tap the block to get this seam to come together, but these ones don't actually have an overlap, which makes the install quite a bit easier. With this sort of half inserted in there, you slide it up until the two touch, and then gently push it down. And what holds this in place is actually the next board going across here. So this area is locked in, this area is locked in. And when I put the next board on, it'll lock this one in place. That means no hammering. That should be an easier install. Now what that also means is that I have been putting the boards down in the right order and I can't put them in the other way around because they need to drop down on top. If I tried to go from that end to this end, I'd be trying to push them underneath. So I'm gonna keep doing them from that end to this end. So now that I've got the first three rows in, it's time to move the kitchen back over and then we can clean the rest of the floor and continue on.
how are you picking these? Why? Oh, I just don't want to have a duplicate board next to another one and like separate the light and dark boards. So you're trying to get light with dark, not light with light? I just don't want too many dark ones beside each other and too many light ones next to each other. Okay. <laughs> Up to this point, it's been pretty straightforward. Straight boards end to end, but now we get to where the shower pan is. This means that I could end up with a short seam, which would be not very strong, and I want to try to avoid that. So what I'm going to end up doing is actually working from the opposite end. So I'm going to use a full length board there, which ends up putting this board somewhere around here. And that means I have a full length seam here and a full length seam here, which is going to be the strongest. It also avoids having a seam right in front of where the shower is going to be. And any seam that's avoided in the kitchen area is going to be a good thing. That means working from the opposite end, I've got to take the length of that board, the length of this board, and then trim that end of this board. Now, happened to be that I had one board in the pack, in one of the packs that we bought, it actually looked like it had been taken out and trimmed by someone and then slipped back into the package and returned. Not really what I paid for, but I can use that here because I need to cut that end of this one off here anyway. So working backwards from this end, slipping this board in, a little bit of a gap at the end. We can see that just gives me enough material to get here. Now what I'm going to do is kind of the opposite to what I was doing to cut the boards. That's where I need this board to end. A little bit harder to slide it underneath so I can now take this board back out again, put this board in, to line up exactly with where the last board will come to, right there. Now I can use the edge of the plywood to mark where these cuts are going to be and then I'll measure on the back where I need to rip it along here. That's going to take a little bit of a different piece of equipment so I'm going to have to go inside and use my bandsaw. Now working backwards for the last board, I can do the same trick. That lines up my edge here. I've got my gap at the other end. So now if I cut this board off here, when I flip it around and put it in that much farther back, it should line this seam up here. So the end of the board will end up here, which will get all the other boards to line up across there. Now that I've cut this board to the right size and installed it, I know this one's exactly in the right place. I've marked out where it needs to be cut and it happens to be exactly two inches handily. So I have a nice tape line all the way along the edge. I can cut this one and then fit that one. Off to the bandsaw. be pretty amazing if the width of the box was exactly the width of the boards. Of course it's not. So the last run of boards I'm gonna have to rip the entire length. Unlike this one where I had to cut part of it out, this one here and the last one over here need to have the full length done. So I'm gonna use the table saw. I got the last two pieces ready to go in here 
and that should be a nice quick wrap up. All right, one there, one here, and that's a good thing because it sounds like somebody's garage is on fire somewhere, so I should probably get going. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Well, those people were very lucky. Remember, always unplug your lithium battery chargers when you're not around. Let's take another look at this finished floor. I think it came out quite well. Wasn't all that hard to do. Hopefully, it lasts. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.